assembled a terrific panel tonight on a topic that I hope is, is of interest to students and alumni as well. So it's terrific to see uh, such a great turnout for this event. Guy Cody, with over 10 years of executive search experience building leadership teams from South Florida, he's partner in charge of Hydrogen Struggles Miami office. Guy has worked with a diverse <coughs> group of global clients in a number of industry sectors, including consumer, industrial, financial services, information technology, and nonprofit. In addition to his concentration on CEOs and general management, Guy has recruited executives in a variety of functional disciplines. His experience in marketing and sales has helped clients to design strategic teams responsible for creating, transforming, and growing brands. He has also partnered with companies to develop talent and elevate executive bench strength in finance, human resources, and operations. Guy has worked on pan-regional projects with counterparts in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. <laughs> Beth Hicks. Beth is a senior client partner in Corn Ferry International's Miami office. Ms. Hicks has been in the executive search for more than 10 years, and during that time has built a track record of performing excellent work. Her experience spans industries and functions, but is heavily focused on financial positions, financial services, and nonprofit organizations. Ms. Hicks is experienced in both domestic and international work, and is widely recognized for excellence in customer service. Prior to her search career, Ms. Hicks had more than 25 years of experience in international and domestic and commercial banking. Prior to joining Corn Ferry in 1998, Ms. Hicks was Executive Vice President and Director of Corporate Banking for Barnett Bank, South Florida. Before this, she spent 15 years with Marine Midland Bank, Hang Seng Bank in New York City. <laughs> Michael Savori. Michael is the Market Director of K-Force, overseeing finance and accounting and technology staffing services in South Florida. Raised in Northern Virginia, Savori graduated with a business degree from Shenandoah University, where he played college baseball. Before joining K-Force in 2006, Savori served in the staffing industry as a recruiter, account executive, regional sales manager, and regional director in Washington, D.C. and Boston, where he was recognized as Salesperson of the Year in 2001 and Manager of the Year in 2005. So what I would like to do is invite each of our panelists to speak very briefly on the topic, which is career strategies in uncertain economic times, a topic that's of interest to all of us, and then I'd like to open it up um, to questions from the audience. Okay, maybe I need the mic on that. you tell me. Um, well, thank you for having us. This is a real pleasure. Um, the firm that I represent, Hydro Struggles, and I know we've had um, some different vantage points in the panel, we focus on recruiting C-level talent, CEOs, and cross-functionally will help clients recruit um, CFOs, Chief Marketing Officers, Chief HR. So I think some of my commentary today will be on what trends in executive leadership may be of interest to people uh, in this room. And it's been a very uh, interesting year for our business. And I'm sure well, as you're looking at what's next for you in your career as alumni or people in school, it's probably a little daunting um, what's out there. And that, that's probably a little healthy uh, and it's a little scary. Um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the clients that we're working with are using this economy to change the game in some ways. So they're taking advantage of access to talent that they wouldn't normally have, trying to get people interested in their business because of the anxiety that may exist in corporate America today. So we're helping clients change the game in, in terms of talent. And I think the candidate side, which I know a lot of the questions we're going to get tonight are about, you know, as a candidate trying to change the game the way I do. There are a lot of opportunities to get the messages out in creative, thoughtful ways with new technology, new channels, new types of networking, but I think it can be very effective. And I hope some of the questions that we get tonight are about how to market oneself in this type of economic dynamic. Okay. I guess I'm next. Um, I'm Beth Hicks, and uh, like Guy, my firm uh, specializes in retained search at the executive level. We're getting some feedback here. Do I need that? Um, and um, yet, I will tell you that um, a lot of what we have learned as executive search professionals, we think, is very applicable to you as you think about your careers going forward. Our clients, typically, when they look for executives, are looking for executives that have a wide breadth and depth of talent and experience. 
as you look forward at your careers, a good career strategy in this incredibly changing environment, not only today, but throughout your career time, where the velocity of change is going to be ever increasing, a good career strategy contemplates that you're going to get experience in a wide variety of industries and a wide variety of functions. And so I always advise MBAs uh, who are getting out of school to really think about what a career strategy might entail. That becomes doubly important in this economic environment because while it is tough to get your first job, you should look at any opportunity at a new job as not the job of your lifetime or even the job in the career path that you're necessarily most interested in, but rather an opportunity to pick up transferable skill sets because the executive of today, and most especially the executives in your career time, are going to be people that have demonstrated an incredible um, span of responsibility and experience and incredible learning agility. And learning agility implies that you've had experience taking on new challenges, new functions in different industries. And so I think actually you could look at this very challenging economic environment as an opportunity to do something perhaps a little bit different than you might otherwise consider given your longer term career goals. But no experience will be a negative long term over your career time. So for example, I know when I first came out of school, the last thing on my mind was being a salesperson. I must tell you, getting sales experience early in your career could be the best thing that you could ever do. Because invariably, any executive position you might hold later in your career will require sales experience. CFOs have to sell to Wall Street, to shareholders, and even mid-level managers have to sell their ideas, their vision, their passion to their team to get everybody moving forward. So you might consider doing something out of the box that you didn't perhaps contemplate and might not even see as a long-term career objective, but would give you a diversity of skill sets that are transferable into a variety of opportunities. So I encourage you to look forward, even in this challenging economic environment, consider it perhaps a good circumstance and an opportunity. Okay, very good. Any questions? I <laughs> am um, Mike Savori. Uh, I work for K Force Professional Staffing and Consulting. Um, we specialize in information technology, finance and accounting, uh, government services, healthcare. Uh, so we're in the, in the four quadrants right now, which kind of go multi across uh, all platforms and industries. So um, it has been a very um, tough last two years, but we, uh, we, we see a lot of really good and positive things that are coming out of this. And um, to echo the sentiments that were, were said before me, um, what I say to my team and my staff is that, that you have to become good at something. And you can be good at a bunch of things, but when you look at something, you have to be able to master that trait. Whether it's sales, whether it's finance, whether it's accounting, whether it's an industry, you have to put your foot in the door and really master it and take advantage of it. We place, on average, um, within the information technology, finance, and accounting fields locally, we place, on average, about 30 to 30 to 40 people a month right now. Um, most of them recently are more in the, in the consulting side based on projects that are awarded, but a good thing what we're seeing in the industry right now is actually is companies have potentially cut too thin. They still have some projects that need to be done, but they're looking for specialties in different areas where people will excel. So, you know, being a part of this program is, is definitely going to put you in a position that's going to allow you to be, be considered as, as that finalist for an interview, and then obviously it comes down to you to be able to land the position. Um, you know, again, with, with the industry where it is right now, people laugh and they say, well, why are you in staffing? Well, you know, I graduated with a business degree and a minor in finance, and I have no idea how I got in this industry, but, um, you know, from Boston down to, to Miami, it's the exact same sentiment. It's, you know, be in front of your customers, be good at something, and you'll always be, so be better than somebody else at something else. Great, thank you. Um, let's see if anyone has any questions for the panel at this point. Um, I kind of heard a couple different things in the sense that something which I've always wondered, I feel from what you said towards the end, it is best to do one thing really well. Um, would you agree with that at the cost of being able to do like many things like kind of well? Like for example, well, we, get, we get electives here at the end of a second year. So you could either take electives all in like one area of finance and not take any CIS or MAS electives or accounting electives. 
or you think it's better to take a few of like obviously get one concentration, but with the other electives, like take take one CIS or one NAS. Basically, do you think it's easier to place somebody that has some skills in many different aspects of business versus someone who's highly specialized in one aspect of business? Get into that one. So. Yeah, I, I don't think you want to pigeonhole yourself into one area. Um, here's a good example. In the IT side, we have application development, we have infrastructure, telecommunications. They're all going to somewhat link into each other. And if you pull most of the people that are in like enterprise resource plans or high level disaster recovery, they typically get their foot in the door somewhere. So it's not in a, in a program of education. I don't see you're pigeonholing yourself by maybe staying in, in one, I mean, I'm sorry, I, if you diversify your, your portfolio in education, I think that's okay. But once you pick something to go after, learn as much as you can. <coughs> and then once you find your niche, get really good at what that is. Um, whether that's the application piece or infrastructure, I'm just giving an example of one of the areas where I think you can excel. But from an education level, I think I think the more is the, is the merrier. And then you get to see for yourself that, that gives your opportunity to pick and choose what you'll be good at. And let me add to that. I think early in your career, <clears throat> specializing in being very good at something establishes your credibility. And once you've done that, and then volunteered perhaps to become involved in task forces in, in the company, and you've demonstrated that you can add value beyond your immediate responsibility and expertise, that gives you the opportunities to expand beyond the specialty. When you first start out, so for example, when I first got out of undergraduate school, um, it was also a terrible economy. I won't say which recession it was. I'll give away my age, it's a long time ago. However, I took a clerical job in the bank. It was absolutely, it was administrative assistant, but it was a job. And I put my head down and said, you know what, this darn administrative assistant they ever hired. And as a result, and this will also give away my age, I was the first female to ever enter the management training program at Kenneth Bank in the world. Because I just put my head down and said, you know what? These vice presidents, they're not smarter than I am. They're just a farther ahead in their career, and I can prove myself. And so I did just a great job at my little job. But then that led to more opportunity and more opportunity. And over time, I was able to do lots of different things originally in banking, and then I completely changed careers 12 years ago and went into executive search and uh, talent management consulting. And so, you know, there are opportunities to expand your horizons, but early in your career, you can establish your credibility with being really good at a particular thing. So I think we're saying the yeah. same thing. Oh, but that's a that? great statement. statement. The last time I checked, I didn't see Sylvan or DeVry on the, the, the banner here, and this is not a trade school, so I don't think any employer, and again, you can mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, will hire you based on what you're studying in school. It's what, how you articulate right. what you've learned about business here that I think will be most compelling to an MBA recruiter. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah, it's sort of, a, it's, it's a similar question, but I guess more broad. If you know what industry you want to get into. I know um, Ms. Hicks talked about kind of going in all different areas and, uh, you know, getting an expertise in what you're doing from many different areas. But someone like me, I know exactly what industry I want to get into. Is it better to branch out and learn different avenues and then work your way back in? Or is it good to start from the beginning and maybe start at a lower end job, gain your connections, get your foot in the door and work your way up from there? or to go outside and work your way back in? I think either strategy can work well, depending upon where you find the opportunities. And of course, in this economic environment, you have to be willing to go in either direction, depending upon where the opportunities lie. I would tell you that the reason I suggest that you also get different industry and different functional experiences, think about the velocity of change in your career time. I can't tell you how many telecom execs, and I'm sure you got the same thing, when the telecom industry was terribly over capacity and was laying off people left and right. And I would get these resumes from people who had done nothing but telecom. And, oh, by the way, hadn't networked, and we need to talk about networking too. Hadn't networked either, and they were just out of luck. I mean, what could I tell them? They hadn't demonstrated the ability to work in another industry. They really had no other options but telecom, and telecom wasn't hiring. And, oh, by the way, they didn't have a network. 95% of all jobs are found through networking. It's a really sad story. So my recommendation around getting different functional and different industry experience is partly the protection that it affords you 
as your, over your career times, over the next 40, God help you, you're gonna have to pay for my retirement, so it might be 50 or 60 years. Um, the, the, the length of time you're gonna have to work, you don't wanna end up in, a, in one industry that turns out to be the buggy whip manufacturer of your generation. That would be a pretty awful circumstance. So the some other of this has to be specific, specific to what you wanna do and, and, and how old you are and all that. So if you're an engineer going into a very mechanical job, you, know, you probably wanna pursue something. I would also tell you that when um, we work on CEO and CFO level jobs, our clients want people that have a broad perspective on things. The world's getting to be a complicated place. Enterprises are really complicated, operating in a very complicated environment. So the broader your experience, the more diversity of experience you have, the more value you bring to the enterprise. Um, just a question. Um, what you, would you recommend the same different industries? But what we see here is that once you have the expertise in one industry, the trend is being hired for the same industry. Right. For example, if I want to go to finance, probably the banks will look at my resume, oh, you don't have any experience in finance, so what you're doing here. And how do, what we do yes. recommend to start this search without losing also your momentum in this industry and growing this industry? Okay, so to change functions, the easiest way to change functions is to be in a company and I always recommend if you can, get into a company that invests in its people early in your career. Because A, the pedigree is great. And B, what they invest in you, even if you take a smaller salary, the investment they get in you, you need to look at as part of the value proposition. And early in your career, getting that development by a really good company is invaluable and increases your earning potential over time. Um, if you can work for a company that views its talent in that way, they are gonna be more likely to allow you to try out different functions. So actually, I did many different things in banking, and one of the reasons I did is I worked really hard and proved myself in one area, and they said, wow, she's got more potential, let her try this and let her try that. But then at some point, fairly early in your career, you ought to think about taking the area of expertise that you're strongest in and trying to, to move to a different industry using that experience because very often companies will find it valuable to take somebody from, banks for example were famous for hiring marketing people out of consumer products companies. Great opportunity to kind of take your experience and value quickly to a different industry, but also broaden your perspective. Hi, stayed up so I'm talking to people just their heads. Um, I was curious, this maybe is a little broad, but what have you seen as some good career strategies for former finance professionals um, as far as you know, transferring your skills to another industry or you know, getting back into the industry? What, what have you seen to be successful you know, in the last 18 months? Um, are, what industry? I'm sorry? From financial services? Yeah, from somebody who has like a, you know, finance, my, my background is finance and real estate finance, so like, those, those are obviously really tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just kind of looking for ideas, like the, you know, if you had any rules of thumb, like you know, banks hiring marketing professionals from large corporations. Something yeah. Like um, okay. So I, I'm the fine, I'm the financial services person up here, I guess. So um, believe it or not, I'm starting to get busy in financial services again. And if you have a real estate and finance background. Actually, you might find some interesting opportunities because the next wave of problems in financial services is gonna be commercial real estate workout loans. And there are not enough people out there that have the background to do a very good job. Now, if you look at the current environment, generally healthcare and government are the two big areas that are hiring right now, just kind of broadly. Um, banks are gonna to have to bring on people to work out real estate loans, but so is the federal government. So you're gonna see huge hiring, I predict, out of the FDIC most especially, to work out problem real estate loans. And so given that you have real estate background and you have finance background, it might be an entry level job and you might have to kind of work for somebody that's worked out problem loans in another cycle, but that would be great experience for you and a good way to parlay your background. And there's also litigation firms that are out there right now oh, yeah. that are hiring for the loss mitigation. So mm -hmm. you can go look you know, at opportunities, whether it's, I mean, we, we're in consulting and, and the permanent placement as well, so we're seeing a lot of opportunity for that. Is it gonna be the same position, same pay that you had 18 months ago? Probably not. Um, but if it gets you in that opportunity, diversifies you a little bit, it's, it's gonna pay off tenfold later on in your career. 
I'll take a little, I'm gonna take your question with your question. Um, <laughs> when McDonald's retains us to find a CEO, we call the guy at Burger King first. Usually there's a bullseye. And then we expand it as we help our clients. When the guy from Burger King says no, then we have to think about who else do we call. We can go to other restaurant companies, but we expand it <coughs> thinking about what's the McDonald's model about. Um, it's multi-site real estate. It's sales and marketing to the consumer. It's global. And so we try to translate competencies from other sectors into the quick service restaurant sector. So for a guy looking at commercial real estate from a financial services standpoint, there's probably translatable skills that can go into retail or hospitality. Schools are growing, so education. So there's other sectors that I'm sure you can leverage your skills in very, very nicely. Oh, and tenant reps are real busy these days. If you call um, any of the real, big real estate firms, CBRE, for example, Cushman Wakefield, the tenant reps right now are just going, they're out of their minds with work. And I've got to believe that they're looking to bring on people and your, your analytical background, your finance background, and your real estate background could be a good fit for that as well. Uh, I was going to say, um, the university in particular has put in a huge amount of money in trying to build up the biomedical field in South Florida. Have you all seen evidence of that industry growing? Are they looking for people? And in what sort of capacities have you had experiences? Well, I mean, I, that hits home for us and for me because our healthcare division is clinical research and health information management. So um, we're seeing, obviously, with Scripps up north, um, you're seeing an influx of that coming into the market. Um, there's also a lot of programs that there's home-based folks within that sector that are working on national projects. So if they're up in Boston and Cambridge or, or in San Diego or in Maryland or in RTP, RTP um, it, is a very, it is a very much one of the hottest growing sectors out there is clinical research. So yeah, they're putting a lot of money into it because it is hot. Uh, healthcare positions for us right now, whether it's finance and accounting, this kind of goes across all the lines, technology, clinical research, even the coders that actually sign you up at the with one of our divisions will sign you up and bring you all the way through from uh, when you enter the hospital to you leave, we're seeing a huge influx of, of business within that area. And the key to that though is they're looking for people that have, have leverageable skills potentially in other markets or are willing to get into a position where they weren't in before. You know, the smarter, but you know, obviously more qualified for the less financial constraint. I just wondered, you mentioned um, about companies changing the, the game. Can you give us a bit of um, information on how companies are changing their strategy in terms of recruitment? What are they doing that's yeah. different because of the economic crisis? I think they some, doing some companies are looking to consolidate functions. So in the past, they had a head of sales, a head of marketing. Now it's a chief commercial officer that's doing both, or a chief, a chief marketing officer. So we're watching some consolidation of functions as companies try to do more with less. Um, in, in the marketing, depending on the function, my answer is going to change. But in the marketing function, a whole new set of channels are emerging in social networking, in e-commerce, um, that I think are affecting the, the, the big brand campaigns that were so famous in the past are being, you know, not sidelined but decreased, and, and different dollars are being put over new channels. And I think marketing executives that understand the digital piece are really in demand. So they're changing the types of people they're hiring, the types of environments they're hiring them from and the types of roles that they'll have. And I'm just picking on sales and marketing because it's an easy target, but I'm sure we can make the same argument in finance. Human resources, I mean, the way you pay people, the way you retain people, the way you build and train morale people is changing. So the HR function is definitely getting a lot of elevated discussion with our clients. Um, the lawsuits that are going around, I, I, I run the hospitality practice for the firm, so I'm gonna do a lot of examples of McDonald's and Burger King or Starwood and Hilton, which is more along the lines of I'm going to an ethical discussions that are going on the legal function is getting elevated. So it's a really interesting time to watch business look at talent in different ways. Um, and I think for somebody looking to promote themselves, um, there's opportunities to get in front of the more traditional people that are somewhat boxy in their approach to talk about being a different type of executive. And, and in the finance function, there's a real move towards um, enterprise risk management. So instead of having a general auditor and having a VP of finance and having a controller, they're putting pieces together and having a, a chief risk officer, if you want to call it that, in fact, many do call it that, that has a, an enterprise-wide responsibility for managing risk. So it isn't just the old-fashioned, gee, what's our insurance policy say? It's, what's our reputational risk? They've got to work with marketing. What's our financial risk? What are the market risks that we face? 
and that is true um, across all industries, actually. And that is really an evolving role that um, more and more companies are focusing on. I would also add that um, a lot of our clients are, quote, changing the game <coughs> because they're using this environment to upgrade the quality of their talent overall. So they're letting go the ten, bottom 10%, and then they're going out and cherry picking the best kind of A athletes that they can find. In fact, we're working on a couple of projects for Fortune 25 companies with exactly that in mind. And, and to put my P&L hat on, since I have responsibilities for that for the for South Florida, we're, we're doing the same thing with shared services. We're pulling everything from a corporate function, centralizing a lot of our processes that created duplicate roles. But for every position that we've kind of had duplicate efforts, we've actually created other opportunities as a firm. So um, that's where we've gotten a little bit stronger from that. We, I mean, the prime example we have, you know, we're we're a consulting firm, so we have a resume writer. Why couldn't that be centralized out of a uh, out of our corporate office. We have recruiters that if there's a high volume account where, let's say we talked about loss mitigation, if there's if there's a, one of our groups is placing a lot of people in that one area, we have a national recruiting center now in corporate that is, does a lot of the higher volume positions for us so that although the recruiter position didn't come back, it allowed us to hire other outside salespeople. So the head counts didn't change, but more the world is more centralized right now. So we're getting smarter with our processes as a business user. It would be interesting, Alex, if you retain history in terms of who came here five years ago and what roles they were recruiting four or five years ago and compare that to today and just see if the game is changing at the MBA recruitment level. I, um, it was mentioned that you know in the beginning of your career it's important to go with a company that wants to invest in their employees. With that in mind, would you say it's, it's more advantageous to go with a bigger firm that it has a you know name brand recognition, or is it better to go with a smaller firm where you can get more uh, diversity of experiences within that uh, firm? So, I would say it depends on what your career objectives are over the longer term. Some people just aren't comfortable in a big corporate environment, and so you kind of have to go where your heart is. And that's also one of my I have top ten hits for MBAs, and, and one of them is be passionate about what you do. You work too hard in your life to not really like what you're doing. By the way, while there will be lots of opportunities for you over your career time, because my generation is going to retire, it might take us longer and the opportunities may not be there quite yet, but we are going to be retiring in a couple of years, and there simply are not enough people coming up in the generation behind us to take the place. So you're going to have plenty of opportunities. But the best opportunities there's always going to be competition for. And you can, be, you can work really hard and be really smart, and you can be beat out every time by somebody who has a passion for what they're doing. It just, it just comes across in so many ways. So while if, you're, if your longer term objective is to be an executive in a decent sized firm, anything from a billion dollars up, I would say, you probably ought to spend some time in a big company because the complexity and the sophistication that you learn early in your career is going to be viewed as very important by future employers. On the other hand, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there's some great opportunities, and of course with the launch pad here, there's some great opportunities in what 90% of all jobs in this country are, are really generated by small businesses. So if your passion is being an entrepreneur, then working for a smaller company is maybe better, in fact, because you learn how to be entrepreneurial in a way that you don't in a bigger company. Sorry to be so vague. But <laughs> no, but if you, if you, to add on that too, just an analogy on that side, is if, if you look at the high school you were at and then you started selecting colleges, some picked a larger school, some picked a smaller school, some picked a smaller school in a large university because of the way they felt most comfortable. And, and there's training <coughs> programs like you wouldn't believe from an entrepreneurial level to a Fortune you know, 500 company. So you gotta pick what's most comfortable in some ways that, and, and then and that will evolve and that will change based on your career aspirations. I have a lot of strong biases, and some of them are probably illegal. But um, <laughs> my bias is that coming out of school, it is better to get some traditional training, a larger environment. Because if you look at you know, the types of people that P&G or Kraft or Colgate would hire, they're, they're typically out of the MBA program, or they're from other large CPG companies. If you want to work with a large branded company, it's good to get that at, at the get-go. They're not going to hire Kraft out of deramate.com. You know, it's not something that's in the Kraft model to do. So if you want that experience is probably better to use this as a springboard to getting that experience. And that, that's a bias, but hopefully helpful. Obviously the job market isn't what it was a year or two ago, but um, and I'm not sure how many other people might be in this situation. If you're currently employed and 
for one reason or another looking for a career change, maybe in the same industry, maybe with a different company, whatever the case might be. What is the best way of going out and uh, you know getting in front of the companies that you either might want to work with or um, just seeing what opportunities are out there for you? I mean, is it monitoring what's coming in online from you know career builder and all these other firms is it getting out with executive yeah. recruiters is it networking with people that you know but know what you do and know the company you work for and you know it can be a little it's, a little crazy I mean it's all about networking network 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 that ha that should be a lifelong project for you because 95 percent of all jobs are found through networking and especially if you want to make a career transition if you go online or you go through HR and you post your resume, if the boxes that they're looking for get checked, you might maybe hear from them. Probably you won't though. But if you can identify the companies that you're interested in and then talk to your friends and your network about, do you know anybody in this company? I'm not gonna ask them for a job, but could you introduce me? And then promise them, say, I just need 15 minutes of your time. I wanna find out more about your company how you got into it and learn from your experience. Everybody's flattered by that. And by the way, most successful executives have done it all their lives too, so they know exactly what you're doing. And they would welcome the opportunity to help you. Um, and then that gives you the entree where people are more likely to see you as a professional with transferable skills rather than can we check the box on this position spec opposite your resume. So it really is all about networking. Um, that, you know, LinkedIn, the social networks are helpful. LinkedIn, we use LinkedIn a lot, actually, um, to identify potential candidates. Um, because you would be amazed that virtually every level of executive, from lower management to middle management to executive management, they now socially network through LinkedIn and other sources. And so that's actually not a bad way to, to expand your network by joining groups that might be of interest. The other thing I would tell you is be visible in your profession. And what that means is taking leadership roles in the professional organization. So if you're a CPA, being in a leadership role and being really active in the AICPA local chapter is really valuable because where do you think we look for, for candidates? Among one of the things we do is we will call the professional organization that represents whatever you know expertise we're looking for We'll call them and say, gee, who do you know who? Well, they're not going to remember the 5,000 members, but they are going to remember who you know, Joe, who acted as treasurer or sat on this task force. And so we get a lot of our referrals that way, and that, I think, also helps <coughs> in the process. And, and we recru our recruiters recruit passive and active channels, so those are the two areas they go. Obviously, the folks that are gainfully employed and then those that are on the monster career builder. Um, the ones that has the higher probability of getting the positions are the ones that we, we pulled from our passive channels and the referral chain. Um, you mentioned LinkedIn. Has anyone ever heard of Facebook? Okay. Um, we use Facebook in groups, but we, you know, to recruit folks out of that because that's the way of the world and that's the way it's evolving. One rule on that one, though, make sure that your Facebook page, if you are linking up to people for a job, or your LinkedIn page, if it is, is professional in nature because we have actually, when I've interviewed folks, we go on LinkedIn and we'll, we'll, if we're doing a phone screen, we'll pull up their, their page. And although we like to have fun in our positions, if they're partying and stuff like that, the, the phone screen might not lead to a personal uh, interview. So be careful about that. Our recruiters actually have two different pages that they'll use for their professional and their personal. Um, but networking is key. I, what, every position I've had, um, I've, I've had four. Um, just moving in my different careers. They've, I've had to update my resume when I was getting in, interviewed by the executives. That was it. Um, I was already through three interviews by that point and never posted my resume on, res on Monster Board. Now, <coughs> with the unemployment rate coming up a little bit, post your, your information on Monster is fine. You're going to get calls, you're going to get feelers, but what we said is you make those phone calls directly into those recruiting departments. And lastly, because I'm talking a lot, um, we were at a Fortune 50 company, or a Fortune 100 company in South Florida this morning with our staffing division, and they were talking about how they select people for the staffing positions, and it was kind of funny. The person that was, there was, an, there was a high range SAP architect position, was in a given as an example, and there was an admin assistant that was checking one through 10 what skills were, were, were the best and based on rate. 
and she had no idea what SAP was, but she was ranking them based on speed and timing, and it was it was kind of ludicrous because the best person might be number 11 that's most qualified, but you have somebody that's not technical that's doing it. So networking is key, getting out in front of folks, and again, the way of the world is social networking in some ways, it, it, it enhances our job. Make sure it's professional, make sure you're using it the right way. Guys, do you have a comment on networking? Um, I have a comment about looking for a job when you have a job. Um, and it's, uh, you have to know your story because if you're the chief financial officer at Burger King and you want to leave and you want the job at McDonald's, why? You know, what's, what, what's wrong with Burger King that's going to be right at McDonald's? So you have to have the right story to tell it. But is it money? Is it location? Is it, so you have to have some pretty good reasons. And then you also have to be prepared if you're going to be actively networking in the marketplace that it could get back to your employer that you're on LinkedIn and Facebook and it's about needing a job, wanting a job, and, and so just be careful that your resume through Monster doesn't come back to your HR department's desk, because uh, it could, and just be prepared to have a story about I'm just networking, but careful. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. If you're a passive candidate, do not put on Monster. <coughs> I would just like to, you know, I graduated from this university several years ago. Uh, this is such a wonderful opportunity for your students, particularly in the MBA program, to have the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with who are obviously a diverse age group, but extremely uh, well versed, not just in their profession, but with the current lingo, you all are very lucky. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. uh, to go back to the subject of the Monster Program, uh, Monster Program is uh, in their employee, how can we find out during the recruiting process whether a firm does that or not and to which extent? Um, you know the famous end of the, the um, interview question, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Great time to say, um, tell me a little bit about um, talent management, about how you plan succession, how you develop your people. Um, give me an example of someone that entered in at this level and, and what their career path might look like. And they're likely to say, wow, they're really serious about a career here. They really are a continuous learner. They really are interested in self-development. And good companies are going to first react that way with the question. And secondly, if they can say to you, oh, well, when you come in, this is what happens. Here's your orientation period. Here's your onboarding process. Here's the development opportunities over time. Yes, we. every employee has a development plan. Those are all key processes of, uh, that represent a culture of developing and investing in their people. I mean, during the extended interview process, you may even have an opportunity to meet people who would be more or less at a peer level or maybe one level up from you, and it's a great chance to pick their brain about, well, how does that really work? You may have a question about even before you get the interview, how do you figure out which companies are doing that? And you probably can figure out who are the top 10 employers of UM MBAs. You know, where the majority of people going and then how have their careers developed. The annual reports usually have some language, some of the um, organizations that I look at, at Darden Restaurants, for example, um, Starwood Hotels, have language in there about the development of people and the culture around that. So I think some of that you can kind of feel for. Now I think it's great. I mean, I, I, the, the number one question that we get asked in our interviews now of people that are recent graduates or coming out of an MBA program is what's the vacation time and, and, and you know, what are the core business hours, things like that. That's where it, it, you just That's struck a chord. That's the wrong question. To yeah, ask. it's like that is the first thing you should be asking because you're here getting a, your, your uh, higher education because you're looking to put yourself in that position. Ask questions that are going to position you for if you ask the question about how much vacation and how much, uh, what the work hours are, immediately they will click off with, work oh, ethic. not a good work ethic. Not a good work ethic. That's something you can ask about after they make the offer. <laughs> um, Gee, send me your benefits package, and yeah. there will be language into, in yes. there as to the vacation, but do not ask that as a question. I'm so glad you suggested that. Are there, are there other questions um, that have similar effect? Yeah, Advice I, that you could give. What, what should they not ask? 
That's good. So yeah, I have a question. Yeah, and, uh, uh, do you have any suggestion on the um, for the international students how to do the networking? I, I found the international students I found it's harder to do the networking because of the culture or the language. Okay, so um, you have two, two huge challenges. One is if you do not have the right to work in this country, even in a good economic circumstance, you've got a huge hurdle to get over because the way our immigration laws work is that an employer needs to demonstrate to the Immigration and Naturalization Service that the skill sets do not exist in the United States to fill that position and that therefore they can hire somebody who does not already have a work permit here. And that's a huge hurdle, especially if you're just getting out of school, because it's highly unlikely that they'd be able to prove to the INS that that's the case. So you have that big problem. My recommendation is that you go to your home country and get a job with an American multinational, do a great job locally, and then they can transfer you into the United States later. Transfers is a whole, that's a whole different animal. And because then suddenly you're a valued employee of a multinational <coughs> corporation and they, they have no problem getting a work permit by transferring you in. But doing it from here as a student or just coming out of school is really, really hard. As far as networking is concerned, um, if you're past kind of that hurdle, um, Miami is really blessed. It's probably, and you know this because you moved here um, from Atlanta or some of you are too, New York. Um, <laughs> Miami, we all came from somewhere else. Networking in this town is really easy because everybody has had to do it at some point. And therefore, there are many, many ways to network here. Um, in addition to professional organizations, if you do not know, there is a monthly lunch at the Chamber of Commerce that is attended by at least 500 people every single month. And it is set up in a way to facilitate networking. Why? Because that's why everybody goes there. They want to meet new people. And so you can actually go to it, and if you're a student, you can get a student entrance, yada, yada, yada. And, um, and everybody goes, grabs a plate, serves themselves a buffet lunch, and then finds a table where they don't know another soul, and they sit down and they just get to meet new people. And there are many organizations in town that do that. That's kind of the biggest one. No, I would suggest, because not everyone's a salesperson <coughs> and uh, outbound, you should use a buddy system when you network. Have somebody with you that will allow you to kind of help break the ice or, or, or kind of help those conversations along, and then they can pull other people into the mix with you because, I mean, it's key. I mean, I get it. I understand it. I mean, we have folks in our office that are relatively new in recruiting, and they just want to pound out and call people. We get them in a networking function. Our outside sales reps, are, you can't even catch them, and our inside sales reps are all huddled in a corner. So... Use a buddy system to somebody that's going to help you get through it, and then once you get in it, you're right, Miami. I'm from I'm from Washington D.C. and lived in Boston too, and that's a that's a difficult place to to network unless you, you culturally can can relate and be a part of the community or be a Red Sox fan or something. But um, <laughs> here, it's everybody's. You're right. Not, not a lot of people are from here, so it's very easy to network. But wait a minute. That's a man. Man. I guess you call it whatever you like. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a good user of efficient time, and so I would say there's probably some companies. And again, as a student coming out, you get the student visa, which gives you some opportunity to work in the United States for a period of time, right? And some companies absolutely, you know, um, celebrate that. So in the consulting firms, um, who's Allens and the BCGs and the McKinsey's of the world, they're they're very good networkers with international um, students. So I would say spend time with them. Um, the large publicly traded companies that you can get in front of Colgate, Kraft, you know, they all know the value of the international markets. They've got international um, executives that transfer all the time, so they'll absolutely appreciate that. Um, and even Burger King, I'm trying to think of the companies here locally, they would probably appreciate the, the networking. But, but do a very thoughtful study on the right companies and the right sectors to network with. Any other questions? Some of us have figured out uh, primary concentration, but uh, looking uh, when we plan for our, our second concentration, I feel that uh, I should look at some concentration where there are more jump number of jobs available. So can you just give us idea, like uh, since you recruit people, <coughs> so can you just give us idea what what percentage of people go into marketing or something like that? 
We, we, do, we do studies quite frequently because our, our market in technology and finance and accounting really changes rapidly because of the demand. And technology, as it ever changes, it's going to obviously take part. But, um, you know, technology, if you're in certain areas, you, you know, there always is a demand for very good programmers, analysts, people that are analytical, that can talk with the clients. Um, from finance and accounting side, obviously, anyone that's going to go and get their CPA um, and kind of go that route would, would obviously be marketable as well. Um, the unemployment trend for those two markets right now is still under 6%, the unemployment rate. So it's still, it, it's still a lot higher than it was before. At one point, the finance and accounting, when I first came down here, was negative. Um, there wasn't enough people. And when there's different generations that are retiring, you can see the amount of, sh of shortfall that's coming into it. So from a technology space with all this cloud computing coming out, if you read on Google and stuff like that, who's going to do it? And, you know, of course, you'd be a doctor as well. But those are the things, those areas that you, you should be positioning yourself to, to be able to, when those opportunities do arise, you're positioned for it. Okay, and, and I would just say broadly, um, obviously, healthcare and government are the two sec only two sectors that are growing right now. And to your point, <coughs> biomedical in, in Florida and South Florida will grow very substantially. I think we're just starting to see kind of the upper levels um, of the biotech ventures being filled now. That's going to trickle down now. And all of those scientists need support staff. So virtually accounting and finance and control for sure, administrative staff. And those are really quite good jobs and pay really well and have very interesting career trajectory over time, both <coughs> in biotech and in healthcare. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, with regards to the response uh, to an earlier question about starting with a small, uh, mid-sized company to a large company. And I, I was particular, uh, uh, particularly looking at the response that Mr. Cody gave uh, as far as it, it, with you know the CPG companies looking for people who have experience with larger companies or some of the CPG companies. Um, if you if you have internship experiences in marketing and have even internship experience with a fortune power company, uh, where do you position yourself uh, to, to look with, with the current economy and the, looking at I mean, the amount of companies in South Florida that are hiring fortune power companies in marketing? Where would you look during these times to, to, to really start and, and get that, that experience that later a company might look at and say, okay, you have that experience with large companies, if, if you are looking at larger companies? Are you asking about where to look for summer internships, or you have a CPG summer internship and you want to leverage that into a better job? Right, so it's for starting for a job, for a, a, a well, lower just level. About, we haven't talked about summer internships, and maybe I'll take it in that direction. This is like, may, may have no, it may not be your question at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm watching more companies look at their summer interns as mm -hmm. a critical full time yes. hiring vehicle. And I see that now more than ever. I think in the past they kind of tested the waters. Now it seems like they're really trying to use summers to get full-time hires. So if you have a choice of where to work in your summer, pick the one where you think you'll fit full-time. Um, and that should be really your effort in the summer is to land that full-time job and at least have one in your pocket that's hopefully a place that you like. Right? Um, and a summer internship is actually a nice, you know, it sets the stage for full-time hires. So if you work, and in CPG, there's so much bias and there's so much insular, you know, arrogance perhaps around that sector that, you know, Colgate wants to hire from Kraft, you know, maybe, maybe Mars, uh, you know, maybe P&G. So they have these, this small echelon there. I guess I could do the same thing if I substitute Booz Allen and McKinsey and Bain and BCG, right? right. Um, and, and IBM, probably, HP. So you've got these sectors that I think, once you get some brands on there that are attractive, it does propel the resume um, in a nice way. So I have a bias against strong brands on a resume, especially for somebody who's less than 35. At that point, you know, take what you've learned and, and leverage that into an environment that really plays to your style and chemistry and skill set. But I think leadership, you know, can be trained. You can get some really good exposure to some best-in-class processes by working for a P&G or a McKinsey. Yeah, and that the value of that pedigree later on in your life is really huge because companies want people who, number one, learned really good ways of doing things and are considered best-in-class, but also they want people of achievement. And rightly or wrongly, the, the level of respect for your achievements is directly linked to the quality of the company that you worked for. 
it just is. I mean, don't you yeah, agree? Yeah, no, I, mean, I agree. It's so interesting you said because I've got a resume today that I was looking at where somebody had worked for some pedigree companies. And it's yeah. terrific. I was excited. My client was excited. And then I started to look at the resume. <laughs> because the person had worked at, at they had worked for you know, Cadbury, they had worked for um, uh, Kraft, they had worked for another CPG. But in each, each stop along the way, and they probably had a 15-year career, they, they moved companies to get promoted. That sort of the man on the move is a man on the make. Um, but they were never promoted in the company that they were in. So they worked for top tier brands, but they never got progression in those brands. So that we've eliminated this person because they weren't able to show progress, upward mobility in the company. And that's, that's important too. So don't take a job just because it sounds sexy at first. Know that it's a company where you can be successful in as, as best you can, and then go in there and progress. Well, and nobody's asked the question of how often can you move. I always get that question. Right. And to your point, um, we routinely, I mean, we don't even give a phone screen to somebody that's moved too much. Okay, so what's moved too much? Um, well, if you figure, most companies figure out that the first year, they lose money on you. Um, by the second year, you've kind of figured your way around, and maybe they break even on you. By the third year, you've added value to the company. So, if you then say, I, I'm looking at a resume, if a person moved every two years, what could they possibly have accomplished? So, not that, I mean, my generation, people were expected to stay 15 or 20 years with the company. That's not true anymore. In fact, quite the reverse, it sometimes works against you. Like, what's wrong with this person? They couldn't do better for themselves, right? <laughs> but I would tell you that you really can't move every two or three years. You've got to stay with the company four or five years. Now, everybody's entitled to a mistake. But if you move every two years, the very best interpretation is you had bad judgment. The very worst interpretation is there's something wrong with this person. They can't keep a job. So be, be careful about how often you move and make sure that when you do move, it is for the right reasons and you have a high probability of being able to stay in a place and, and move up within that organization over a period of time. Until we recruit you away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but that's another thing. I did not do this, I was foolish. Welcome calls from headhunters. If not, even if you're not interested, helping them means that you will stay on their radar and you'll know what your options are. And even if you determine that moving is not in your best interest at that time, you made a better quality decision having more information. So if you get calls from headhunters, return the calls and be as helpful as you can because then you go into our system with what's very helpful <laughs> and you'll get more of those calls. You never know when the, that, those calls could result in the opportunity of a lifetime. And, and, and from a different angle, I actually did make a mistake. I was up in Boston and I got recruited out. I don't know by who. Um, but I, I got recruited out, went for the opportunity of a lifetime. And the day I, I showed up, it was a director level position. And they ended up calling me in and saying, actually, you're going to be an account manager. And this was two, two steps lower than what I was. It was almost like the bait and switch. So. Um, at that point, my feelers, I had moved from, from Boston down to D.C. to be a director of business development, and then all of a sudden, it, my whole world got turned upside down. Luckily, that's where I was, I was born and raised, so I had enough connections to get out of there. But that was my mistake. Um, the next position I went into after that, where I mentioned that I had four, and, and I've, I've been out of school a little bit, but um, the next position I went into was a director-level position for a great company. The problem with the company was, is after two and a half years, they shut down our division. So we had to get out of there, and I went back to my original boss that I had actually worked for my, my first couple years out of school. So even though I made, I made the jump and made the mistake, like you said, you you're, you're, you're get a couple of practice shots. Um, but make them stick, and people look at what you do when you're there. Um. I'd like to thank Alex Pons. Um, this presentation was uh, a partnership with the Smith Placement Center. I'd like to thank our panelists because for taking their time to share their expertise with them, um, with our students and alumni. So, thank you very much. Advice about networking, so you can continue to network. <laughs> okay, a little bit after the session. Thank you.